It is such a privilege for me to be back in town, to be here at Heart of God, and to serve you. So if you're meeting me for the first time, I hope we'll have a good connection and that you will be encouraged, inspired by the insights from my journey. And not just as a pastoral care specialist, but as a man who has to practice what I preach and teach. You know, in walking with the Lord almost 40 years, I don't think I know everything, but I've learned some things, especially in the issues of love and sexuality and relationships. But I want you to understand when I'm here talking to you, two important things. Number one, my events are shame free. I have not come here to criticize. I have not come here to shame. I have come here instead to empower and inspire. I am not here secondly to tell you what to do. Instead, I'm here to share with you what God has done for me. Because I want you to be clear that the miracle is not that I got saved 40 years ago. That is an awesome miracle, but that was only the beginning. The real miracle is that I have walked on with God for four decades. And so I'm just a little further up the road in some of your lives. You're much younger, but at the end of the day, I love to turn around and share with my audiences what made the difference? How come I did not give up, give in, go back to the old things that are familiar? Well, there are answers to that question. And in my time with you this weekend, we're going to share those insights to encourage you to never give up on the character and love and redemption of God in your life. So, to get underway, I want to encourage you to see the God perspective that sometimes right in front of us, we aren't where we'd like to be. We're not seeing that relationship develop as we would hope. Or maybe, uh, you know, you're in some broken relationship yet. But yet, as was said, is a very important word. Do you know, I came from a broken home. I was sexually abused as a child by an adult man, a family friend who had access to me and betrayed my father's trust. He taught me things God did not want me to know. And that hijacked my life. And then my mother was killed in an accident and I'm separated from my father. So I grew up in an emotional vacuum. I was further labeled, rejected, exploited, misdirected. So by the time I was a young adult, I was promiscuous. I was boundaryless. I was confused. And yet just when you would think I'm in too deep of a ditch, that's when God rocked up. And he opened my eyes to his reality. And he did not say, you stop living like that he said stop resisting me learn about me and walk with me and I began a journey of discovery and God earned back my trust and proved to me that I mattered to him and that he's better than I had thought and so as I journeyed with God, He began to bring cleansing to my defilements. He began to bring healing to my angry, wounded heart. And then He loved me through His people and helped me grow beyond the power of my past. I can't change my history, but I get to make new history and go forward from today. This is God's character also for you. He loves you and your situation intimately. And he delights to prove to you, you matter to him. And that there is no problem greater than his love and ability to redeem. So even if you don't feel confident about the way forward, be confident in the character of God. Hold his hand and walk forward with him and him with skin on all around you to support you because God's spirit comes to live in us. But you know, I want to encourage you with regard to broken relationship. My dad and I had a broken relationship. It's true. But finally, after I became a Christian, we began to repair. In fact, I had not seen my dad in almost five years until the day before my wedding. So we had a very damaged relationship. But, you know, God began to bring repair. Trust began to be reestablished. And after 22 years of walking with God, I had the privilege of leading my dad into a rededication to the Lord Jesus. And wait, I got to baptize him myself in the backyard pool. He was 78 years old. So when we use that word yet, my relationship with my dad isn't, isn't very good yet. 
The relationship I have in my family isn't very loving yet. Do not underestimate what God would love to do because we know God loves to restore and heal and work redemption in everything we give him. Amen. So on that note, we've got a lot to share with you. So I think we should pray and get underway. Are you ready? Here we go. Lord, take these words, as always, anoint them with life and power to make this more than infotainment. Make it a revelation. We believe you would delight to make your kingdom richer in us and through us as we commit our time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, you know, as I mentioned, the miracle is not that I got saved so many decades ago. It's that I walked on with God. The miracle of salvation began a journey, a process. And I want to share with you some insights from that journey that I hope will encourage you. Because I realize that many times our histories are very different, but our humanity is the same. But I also recognize that when it comes to issues of struggle and sexual struggle, one of the most common kinds that affect people's lives, and it becomes an interference in the journey with God, and that is in the area of thought life, imagination, fantasy, desire, and even the concern of pornography, a global plague that so easily entraps us. And so, again, this is a shame-free zone. I am not here to do anything other than encourage you. But it's easy to do. Do you know why? Because God encouraged me. But here's why it's significant. Do you know once upon a time in church culture, we could not have these conversations? The attitude of the very religious, you're not supposed to have problems like that. And therefore, if you struggle with such things, you're bad. God is mad. And you know what? That just makes you feel ashamed. That makes you run away from God. Here's the truth that later we would learn. You're not bad. And God is not mad. You are simply human and vulnerable. And God is the great big advocate who has shared our human experience. Therefore, he is empathetic. He is compassionate. He knows what we're up against. But because he has succeeded, he becomes our victory. So my point is... He tells us in his word that if you struggle, if you are wrestling, if you have fallen on your face, get up and come to him. He says, you can come to my throne of grace and you can expect to find mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. But you see, religious culture teaches people, oh no, you got dirty, you must somehow fix it. Then you can come to God. And I want to tell you the power of how to get clean and stay cleaner in a dirty world, in here and out there, by running to God, not from Him. I want to tell you what worked for me. And to give you a principle, we're going to start with this story. Maybe you know it. It's one of my classic messages, borrowing from a truth that I learned in the ancient Word of God in the Old Testament, which is like a treasury box filled with principles that are like jewels. Oh, they may have been written in a different time and culture, but truth transcends time and culture and still has 21st century application in your life and mine. So in the story of 2 Kings chapter 5, the story of Naaman. Now the Bible says that Naaman, well, he was a very great warrior. He was valiant, brave, anointed by God and appointed by God. And he was, if you will, rich and famous because of his great appointing, his great anointing. He was a dynamic, valiant soldier, and he had favor in the eyes of the king of Aram. But, the Bible says, he also had leprosy. Leprosy was a wasting disease. Wasting disease that also brought terrible shame because when you had leprosy, you were now declared publicly unclean and people could no longer associate with you. And when you had leprosy, it was all bad because not only were you infected with it, it would continue progressing and eventually you would experience not just contamination, but disfigurement and death. All bad. And just because he was anointed and appointed by God did not make him immune. Another feature about leprosy, you do not acquire leprosy easily. It's not like the flu where somebody coughs into the air and you breathe in the virus and you too are easily contaminated. No, leprosy is difficult to get. It means he had to be in constant contact with someone unclean. 
And now he had been caught himself. So Naaman was facing a future of being publicly humiliated, losing all of his fame, losing all of his glory, losing his strength and vitality. It was all bad for him. And he didn't know what to do. But you know, his wife had a Hebrew servant girl. She was God's agent strategically placed with a message of hope. And she, banking on the character of God, went to Naaman and she said, You know, Naaman, among my people, there is a prophet. He gets healing words from God. And I'm sure if you would go to him, he would give you a healing word too. Hoping against hope. Well, Naaman undertook, and he went on a personal mission to the land of Israel to hear his healing word. And he approached the prophet's house, but instead of the prophet coming out on the front porch to speak with him, the prophet's messenger came out. And the messenger said this, Naaman, God has heard your cry. Could you imagine that? You travel hundreds of miles to a place you've never been, approach a stranger's door hoping God may have a miracle for you, and then this person comes out and says their first words to you, God has heard your cry. <sighs> and then the prophet surprised Naaman. He said, here's your healing word. Over here's a river. Go and take your contaminated body and dunk it in that river. Dunk it seven times. That's it. That's your word. Go do that. And Naaman said, that's it. I came all this way to hear I should dunk my body in a dirty river. What about the dirty rivers in my own country? Wouldn't they have worked? In fact, he got angrier. He said, the prophet could come out on this front porch in front of me and wave his arm over me and zap me and give me a miracle cure right now. But you're wanting me to submit to a cleansing process? I'm not going to do it. No. And the Bible says he walked away angry. First time I read that, I thought, wow, how modern. I thought it was only we of the microwave civilization that get, <laughs> that get angry with God because he won't give us an instant miracle. So the Bible says Naaman walked away and missed his miracle because of his attitude. Mm, well, we'll get back to that in just a minute. But let me now go into a little bit of application. Why did the prophet say, dunk in the river seven times? God is very intentional with everything. And if you may know Hebrew language, the number seven is a very important number. And some cultures say, oh, seven is the perfect number, as in flawless or mystical. But in Hebrew language, the number seven means this. Thoroughly, completely, completely thoroughly. In other words, here is how we interpret the statement and the principle from Naaman's time that has application to you and I. You have a defilement. You can't fix it. But God has made a cleansing provision. And if you will take your contamination and dunk it in that provision, dunk it again and again, you will thoroughly resolve it. You have defiling thoughts. You have unclean attitudes. You have memories that corrupt. But don't be afraid. God has a redemptive provision bigger than all of that. If you will admit it and bring that to the provision, which is Christ, the living water, Christ, the well of salvation, Christ, the one who makes us clean, if you will bring that dirt to the one who can make you clean and you dunk it again and again and again until the issue is thoroughly resolved, you run to God, don't run from from God. Are you with me? Anything that makes you feel ashamed in front of God and makes you want to run away from Him, anything that blocks you from wanting to walk forward toward Him, that's the thing you drag into the cleansing provision of redemption and you dunk it again and again because His provision is more powerful than your defilement. Yes? So let me tell you how that principle worked for me. Because I can teach you an idea, but it's putting it to work where we see the proof and the application. So I had been a Christian about two years now at this point many years ago. And at a time in church culture where we did not have these conversations. Aren't you glad your pastors love you? 
and that they are not afraid to have these conversations because they know that not talking will not make you holier. And the evil one talks through all kinds of systems. And if we're not talking redemptively, he wins the conversation by default. So we're going to talk redemptively, not shame, but redemption. So having said this, at a time when church culture did not have these conversations, I did not know what to do with my memories. I learned very quickly after being born again that while the blood of Jesus had washed away my guilt, it did not wash away my memories. It did not give me amnesia. I still struggled with my flesh, my memories, my history, and I felt ashamed. But I didn't know what to do. Being ashamed wasn't productive. It was a terrible ditch to be in. And every day was like an arm wrestling match in my mind. Who would win? I did not know. I thought, surely this is offensive to God. He saves me from my pit, and this is how I pay him back. I was really beating my own self up, too, and the devil helped condemn me. But one day in the middle of all of this, the Holy Spirit and I began to converse. And in so many words, I said this, Okay, Lord, I cannot blame anybody else but me. I'm the one who did the deeds, and now I planted the seeds in the garden of my mind, and it just keeps bearing the fruit. And I didn't understand when I was looking at the pornography or when I was involved in that sexual stuff. I didn't understand that while the blood of Jesus would wash away the guilt, it does not wash away the echo and the memory. Even as the deeds have stopped, there is still the echo. I know that that doesn't apply to any of you, but listen for your friend. Anyway, I was struggling and I cried out and I said, you know, Lord, if it's going to be this kind of a battle for the rest of my life, I need more grace. But if there's something that I can do to improve my circumstances, would you help me? And the Lord began to speak. Sigh. <laughs> when you struggle with your dirty thoughts that you love and you hate, and that's the truth. There is a part of our flesh that loves that stuff, that carnal nature that likes pleasure. It doesn't make us bad, it makes us vulnerable. But he said, when you, when you struggle with those thoughts that you love and you hate, you make two big mistakes. I do. You do. Mistake number one is you try to repress them. You try to shove them down. You try to grunt your teeth and prove to me you're going to be a good boy. Yes, God, isn't that what one is supposed to do? But it doesn't really last very long or work very well now, does it? You've been watching, haven't you, God? Because... Well, admit it, you know, God is not the radio, as I've heard someone say once. God is not the radio. You don't turn him off when you wish to go be naughty. And then you come to your senses and turn him back on. He is in the room with you. Yeah. Watching what you watch online. With you, knowing what you think. His spirit is in you. You are connected. This is not meant to shame you. It's meant to remind you that not only does God observe our lives because we matter, he is a shepherd who guides and guards us from danger. And when he sees us starting to go into a ditch, he wants to bring us back out of the ditch. And if we fall in the ditch, he wants to lift us out of the ditch. In fact, he'd like to stand in front of us and the computer screen and remind us, I'm present to help you in your battle with temptation. Run to me. Don't run from me. So, Cy, when you struggle with your dirty thoughts, you make two big mistakes. And the first is that you think you, by simple willpower, are going to conquer what has clearly conquered your life. And then your second mistake is after trying to battle in your own power, your own will, you finally give in. In a moment of weakness or a moment when you just are tired of pushing the rock up the hill, you give in and you give vent to those thoughts and then they surface with power and you are defiled by them again. And then you slink your way back to me. He said, always come back to me, but there actually is a better way. He, by his spirit, spoke to me. Judge it and see if I heard the Lord. Why don't you do the one thing with your filthy, nasty, dirty thoughts you've never, ever dared to do before? Well, what is that, Lord? Why don't you just admit them and submit them to me? Like this. Look at what I'm thinking, God. I love this, but at the same time, I know it is self-defeating. So while I love this, I love you more. Help me say no and crucify this. 
Lord, the old master calls my name, but you're the new master and you call my name. Help me pick you. Lord, the old voice, it asks for my allegiance and indulgence, but you're the new voice and you ask for my allegiance and indulgence. Help me bow to you. And never did God say to me, no, beg harder. No, I'm tired. Get back to me on Tuesday. Never did he treat me like that. Present help in time of need. Because see, when we think that we are thinking impure thoughts and that we should be pure, well, the bottom line is purity is not your goal. It is a byproduct of what you do. And if you take those thoughts and you submit them to God, he becomes now the rightful master over them. You have given him authority. And as he is the master of those thoughts, then they become holy and are devoted to him and lose their power in your life because now you have bowed to something more powerful than the old master you're bowing to the new. So I began this process of dunking. I began this process of running to God with my thoughts. And of course, like a wellspring that was polluted, every day was an opportunity to practice what I just said. Another day, another round of impurity bubbling up from within. And it used to demoralize me until the Spirit encouraged me. Every dirty cup of thoughts you pour at my feet is one cup less of pollution in your soul. So do not run from me. Dump it out at my cross. I have the power to make you clean. If you Devote it to me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Running to God, not from Him. Yeah. Well, I began to practice this and practice this. And sometimes running to God to me, it meant, you know, well, talking to God in prayer. Sometimes it meant talking with a friend that I trusted over a cup of coffee. Oh, pray for me. I've really been battling in my thought life. Sometimes it meant talking in a support group with other people who shared my weakness but shared the goal of integrity together. And in that camaraderie, we encouraged one another. That's why a therapist friend of mine said, we really should call Christianity Sinners Anonymous because we're all getting over stuff and we need these meetings to help each other stay on track. There's some truth in it. God never said you had to get over something by yourself. So having said it, running to God, running to God. And after doing this day in and day out, lots of bubbling up and lots of admitting and submitting, running to God and taking those impure things and dunking them in the blood of Jesus, dunking them and cleansing them over and over. One day after about four years, and some of you would say four years, well, consider it took more than four years for me to become defiled. It was going to take a little time for things to clear up. But it's kind of like gardening. God's salvation gave me the garden, and he bought it and redeemed it, and now it is his. But in it, I had sown seeds from a previous time in my life. Now we're pulling out the weeds, but we're sowing new seeds of righteousness. And also, we will surely reap a harvest if we don't give up, says the word of God. So now I was in that process. No instant zap for my consumer convenience, but the process. And yet, I realized after about four years, wow, it, it's been like an entire weekend. I have not even been troubled by unclean thoughts. And that may not be a big deal to some of you, but for me, having been molested as a child, I could not remember a day in my life that I was not troubled by sexually intrusive thoughts. And the difference now was very, very stark. And I thought, maybe God has given me amnesia and erased all my memory tapes. So I went to the filing cabinet of my memories to see if there were still some dirty thoughts there. I do not recommend that approach. <laughs> Because, of course, the dirty thoughts are there. Because, of course, the neurons are still there. But here's the difference. Instead of those dark thoughts having power to wash me away like they threatened to do, now they were more like a gnat I could swat away because now I had power over what used to have power over me and I could go on and live my life. But... To get to that plateau, I had to keep bringing it to God, admitting it, submitting it, and dunking it again and again until the issue was thoroughly resolved. And yet all along the way, no shame. Instead, I felt convinced 
again and again of the advocacy and empathy of a compassionate, insightful God who knew the battle I was up against. He adopted me messy, rather having me messy than not at all, but he did not leave me in my messy ditch. So don't give up. Whatever your history, whatever your humanity, you have a Savior who has taken it all into account and he is devoted to helping you achieve his purposes as a responsible steward over your mind and your body. He does not set you up to fail. He sets you up to succeed. But as the Christian writer Oswald Chambers said a hundred years ago, what we need in addressing these things is continuous practice. So don't give up. Get up. You will get there if you persevere. Having said it, my inner world became balanced. My inner world became cleaner. My internal fountain I now found running clearer and cleaner. But that's only half the battle because I live in a contaminated environment. I live in a fallen world and the presence of evil is all around. You know, you can have your morning devotions warm, fuzzy, intentional, and earnest. And then you walk out the door and turn the corner and you can run into something that can provoke and defile. You can turn the channel or turn online and there's something waiting to seduce and corrupt. And so we have to navigate not only internally, but we have to learn to navigate externally too. Agreed? But there the Lord is with us. And let me give you some more principle that echoes the name and concept even in the New Testament. I think of Jesus. John chapter 13. You would know this story probably. If not, let me upgrade your knowing. 2,000 years ago when you went shopping at the mall, when you went out to have coffee with your friends, when you went out and had your big day, well, you walked around barefoot. Middle class and lower class people were barefoot. And if you were wealthy, even then, you wore sandals, but they were open-toed. The point being that when you went out for your big go in the day and you came back at the end of the day, your feet were filthy. They were so dirty from walking out and about. And that's because they did not have nice sidewalks and they did not have paved asphalt roads. The roads were dirty and rocky and there was dust and mud, but also because of animal transportation and because where people would dump their urine, the streets could sometimes be quite polluted with animal and human waste. So when you went out for your little walkabout, you would come in and your feet would be filthy. And yet before you would bring those dirty feet into the house, you would have them washed by one of the household servants in the outer court. Either a servant or one of the children in the home would do this humble task of the foot washing. And in John chapter 13, we see the story where Jesus is now taken upon himself the role of washing the feet of his disciples as they prepare to come in for supper. Now, Peter, the disciple Peter, has had a revelation that Jesus is the Messiah. He's not just a hopeful Messiah. He's not just a really good preacher rabbi. He's not a Messiah wannabe. He's had the revelation from God this is him, the one your people have waited for, the one who will redeem us. So he is, he is scandalized that the Messiah is washing filthy, nasty feet. And he rebukes Jesus. He walks into the door, sees Jesus washing feet, and he rebukes Jesus. And he says, I'm not letting you wash my filthy, nasty feet. And Jesus rebukes him back and he says, I'm washing them or you're not mine. Peter says, well, wash my whole body. <laughs> and Jesus wisely said, I'll just wash your feet. I mean, he had boundaries. And uh, in fact, he goes on to say, as you can read, Peter, I don't need to really wash your body. When you gave your life to me, I made you clean. But then he goes on to infer that part of your life, though, that has interacted with the corruptions of your daily walkabout in the world. That's the part that I'd like to make clean now. You can't make you clean, but I can make you clean if you will bring it to me and admit it and submit it. I will make you clean. Are you getting an idea here? That the Lord in the Old and the New Testaments is saying, you've got contamination in your life that's living on earth, in here due to history and humanity, or out there due to corruption in society. And yet, so what? 
I have a provision that is even more powerful than these defilements, but only shame keeps you from running to me. Only a doubt of my love and character keeps you ashamed before me. So instead, be confident, not only in my ability to make you clean, be confident in my character of love and compassion toward you. Run to me. I have the power to make you clean. Well, let me talk about stinking armpits for a minute. Have you ever wondered why even born-again Christians have smelly armpits? Why? People want to know. Well, as science informs us, we all have stinking armpits. Even when you're born again, this is not changed. I was so hopeful, but yet. Anyway... If it's true for the body, it's true for the soul. If you've ever been in my audiences for very long, you will hear me say it. Because God made biology just like he made psychology and theology. And there is often cross-reference. Because after all, before there was a material world of our biology and matter, there was a spirit world that pre-existed. And that's why all the time Jesus is giving us metaphors and illustrations in the material sense to help us understand the truths beyond the material world. Are you with me? So here's one of those examples in our body. Biology teaches us much. Well, the reason why our armpits stink is because when you go through adolescence, which many of you are right this moment, as you go through adolescence, powerful hormones are secreted in your body from your glands. And these hormones increase from the age of 12 to 17, 600%. I know. Transforming a boy or a girl into a man or a woman with reproductive capability. These hormones make you feel sexual, to prompt you to consider possibility. They don't make you have sex, but they do increase the sexual appetite because in spite of the risks, our species must procreate. And the reason I mention this is that many Christians feel badly when they feel sexually. They think that they are bad, God is mad, because holy people shouldn't feel sexual. But integrity is not the absence of these feelings, it's how you manage them. So I see young people come to an altar and they cry out, oh God, take away this battle of lust in my soul. Take away this battle of lust. I don't want to offend you. And I think God would more accurately say to you, no, dear, I take away your guilt, but not your hormones. I have deliberately designed your body to experience their effect. And I don't take that away. I give you grace over here and guidelines over here. And somewhere in the middle, you will learn to grow up and possess your mind and body as a responsible steward. So just because you feel sexual does not make you evil, it makes you human. And I won't take that away, I give you grace to become a responsible steward and obey me. That you act responsibly in spite of how you feel from time to time. Because these hormones are not secreted on an everyday daily dosage for convenient management, but they are reduced in waves. They, are in, you know, they come to us in waves and in rhythms, and some days the hormonal tide is low and you feel no pressure, and other days the tide is high and you feel like a werewolf. And... Um, that's just the power of your hormones. So that urge to merge begins to surge. But one of... Thank you so much. Anyway, one of the other consequences of these hormones is that they cause you to begin secreting oil from sweat glands, from your oil glands. And this oil is odorless. But this oil is sticky and in a moist place like your armpit. And the oil, because it is sticky, traps bacteria. And the bacteria suffocate and die in the goo. And the accumulated stench of the rotting little microbial bodies is what we call underarm odor. It is the stench of death in your armpits every day. <laughs> you have the population of Tokyo dying in your armpits every day. And... Here's what you know. Here's what you know about it. Last year's scrub up will not make you smell good today. <laughs> Last week's effective bath with a loofah sponge will not make you smell good today. <laughs> Yesterday's shower won't make you smell good today. And even this morning's shower is beginning to wear thinner and thinner with every tick of the clock. Here's the point. If you have to wash the law of death off your body daily, then get a clue for your soul. 
It is not your fault the contamination exists. Fallenness produces death. But you have a potent redeemer who has the power to make you clean and wash the law of death off you daily. Run to his cleansing provision and dunk corruption again and again until the issue resolves. True for the body, true for the soul. Would you agree with that idea? Isn't that amazing? Soap and water for your body. What washes that soul? Nothing like the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The blood of Jesus makes us clean before God, our guilt removed, and now we can become recipients of the Holy Spirit who dwells in this temple. Amen? That's how clean the Lord makes us. But... It is true that we live in a contaminated world and we were not always God's property either. And so there is residual contamination, but we are not left powerless. And so soap and water wash a contaminated body from the law of death. But what about the soul? Here's what the blood does for you. And may I say, we're in the very modern age and therefore we don't really think much about the terrible sacrifice on the cross that spilled the blood of the Christ. We don't sacrifice animals today to make things clean as a symbol. We're far removed from the bloodletting of our faith that began 2,000 years ago and before that with animal sacrifice. And so my point is, even the cross today, instead of it being viewed as a violent tool of execution and shame, we turn it into a stainless steel piece of jewelry. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying it, it, it makes the point we are far removed from the bloodletting aspect of our faith. This said, though, science is a tool we use today, and even science tells us the potency of blood. So here's what you are learning in school. Number one, we know that blood nourishes. It's not the blood per se, but it's blood that transports the oxygen nourishment to every part of your body that lives. If blood does not transport those elements to that part of the body, that part of the body will begin to die pretty quickly. So when the Bible says life is in the blood, it is not only a metaphor, it is a literalism, and biology tells us how and why. That's why communion is not a ritual. Jesus paid a very high price with his blood to transport us into a place of nourishment from God the Father. That's why when we experience communion it is a lovely ritual yes but we must never forget the ritual is actually pointing to something more than a symbol the ritual is reminding us that I can enjoy nourishment from God because blood has made me clean to receive his spirit the blood has transported me into a place of nourishment and also that blood has bought us into a family of relationships that transcend mere services instead we are a community and we enjoy the communion of camaraderie and support so that we can go forward in life not isolated but supported and valued yes yeah. therefore blood it nourishes second thing blood does it is a well protective agent and you would say, how so? Well, let me explain. Let's say you're going to go to the mall. You're going to pick a mall in Singapore, of which we have many, and you're going to ride an escalator to the second level. Just before you got to the base of that escalator, there was a person there who had a lung infection. And just before the person got on the escalator, they did this. <laughs> and then they put their contaminated hand on that handrail. Oh, it gets worse. And then they rode the escalator up to the top and they walked away. They have been gone 15 minutes. You will never see them. But they have left microbes on that handrail and those microbes will live up to 36 more hours. Yalla. So <laughs> you come along unwitting you you come along and you don't you can't see with your natural eyes those microbes but they are there living entities with the potential to be lethal if they gain access and you put your hand right on the sweet spot and you're riding that escalator listening to the music and then you decide to rub your eye or pick whatever and uh <laughs> don't you tell me you don't do that anyway <laughs> Then you take a bunch of those microbes and you rub them into the perfect growth medium of a warm mucosal membrane. But you did not get sick. 
Why? Because even though invaders have been put into your body unwittingly, you have an immune system that functions in association with blood. Because in one drop of blood are 7,000 warrior cells who have one mission in life, to recognize the invading agent and take captive that agent and render it powerless and destroy its authority to harm you. True for the body, true for the soul, under the blood of Jesus, we are kept safe and protected in a world of hostile, invisible agents that would seek to gain authority over your life. And that's why, that's why the Bible says, take those thoughts captive. Because when you take them captive, you're operating in harmony with the way the immune system works, which works on authority. And you take those thoughts. Look at what I'm thinking, God. I love it. It calls my name. But you love me and you call my name. And I admit those things and submit them to your redemptive authority. And the thoughts are broken in their power to infect you. Does that make sense? One more thing that blood does. Blood is a cleansing agent. Really? How can that be? Every laundry expert knows that blood presents one of laundry's greatest challenges. So how does blood cleanse? I'll show. Let's just say you've been sitting in a seminar or a service, and you've been sitting there and sitting there and sitting there because the speaker won't shut up. And so you begin to get that tingling sensation in your foot or your leg or your... Uh, Bottom. And, and, and you know, it's uncomfortable. But you kind of shift around and do whatever you need to do to squirm. And suddenly, the situation resolves. What just happened? Well, here's what. As you may know, when you are sitting, even static like you are, gravity is at work. And if your legs are crossed or you've been sitting in the same position for a while, then gravity is pulling on your body weight. And your body weight begins to crimp blood vessels. And when the blood vessels are crimped, blood volume begins to drop in a certain region of your body, like your foot. And this produces a twofold crisis in time. Part one of the crisis, your cells are not getting their nourishment. Transport has been reduced. And then the second part of the crisis is this. Your little cells, they can't help it, but even your little cells are corrupted. And they produce waste material that is very toxic. And that toxic material begins to poison the cells because the only thing that cleanses your cells is blood. Blood transports defilement away from the cell. But now that there's not enough blood, the cells begin to accumulate their toxins and it creates a health crisis for the cells. And so they cry out together in unity and they speak to the central nervous system something like this. Move! Move your body! We're dying down here! And so the brain interprets this message as pain, and the brain says, Oh, we must do something. I know we'll move and change the weight structure to open up the blood vessels. So I need you to move. And you go, Oh, this hurts. I think I'll move. So you change your position. <laughs> Thank you so much. All those years of theater finally paid off. Anyway... <laughs> So you move, and when you move, here's what happens. When you move, you've lifted the body weight off those blood vessels that are crimped. And then the blood vessels pop back open, and volume begins to return to the afflicted, deprived area. And then your cells take a big swig of nourishment, and then they take their highly destructive sins and dump them in the blood. As often as produced, dumped in the blood. As often as produced, dumped in the blood. And then peace and tranquility and health return to your little cells. And if it's true for your little cells that toxins must be cleansed by the blood, get a clue for your soul. Do not be ashamed of your need. Take advantage of God's provision. Does that make sense? You dunk that again and again and again until the issue is resolved. That's what Christ has done for you. And that's even true with issues like, say, forgiveness where I had a broken relationship with my father. We had not seen each other in years. He never meant to hurt me when he sent me away after my mother's death. He tried to put me in a more stable home than he felt he could afford for me. 
His motives toward me were pure. But I've learned in counseling, it doesn't matter what people intend. It's how one perceives it. And all I knew as a little boy is my mommy is dead. And now the most important person left in my life has given me away. And I resented him. And I judged him. And it wasn't just what my dad did. It's what I did right back. And yet God understood all of this. And now that I was older and more mature, he brought to me the attention. Son, it's not just that you need to forgive your father. I want to remove the obstacle in your soul. I want to forgive you. Your dad may have hurt you, but you hurt him back. Oh, I didn't even see that, Lord. I know. And I'm not mad at you. I want to see you walk in freedom. I want you to be cleansed. So you take that unforgiveness. And what did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 18 when Peter said, so how many times do I forgive somebody if they offend me? Do I forgive them seven times? Peter was trying to impress Jesus. Why? Because in Hebrew culture, you only had to forgive an offender three times. So Peter forgives double and adds one, thinking this will impress Jesus. But Jesus, Jesus counters him and says, seven times? No, Peter, you forgive the one who offended you 70 times seven. He's borrowing the name and idea. It's not a numerical figure he's being pedantic about. He is making the point, if you've got an offense, if you are angry, you've got your reasons. I'm not here to judge or shame you but if you have a wound in your soul I have a cleansing healing comforting provision and you bring that wound and you dunk that offense again and again and again and as I practiced this I was able to release my father from a burden he did not deserve to carry he was reading a version of my story in fact one day at breakfast and when he got to the part where he sent me away, he burst into tears. I never even knew that it mattered to him. He burst into tears and he said, I never wanted to send you away. I didn't know what to do after your mother's death. And people prevailed upon me and counseled me that I should put you in a more stable home than I could afford as I rebooted my life. And yet when I came to bring you back home and I saw how estranged you were from me, I realized as a father, I had made the mistake of a lifetime. And all those years you wandered in sin, I blamed myself for being the world's worst father. Now folks, if God had not reckoned in my soul, I could have said, well dad, even though you screwed up everything, I forgive you. But you see, it took more than the words to repeat. Instead, because God had brought cleansing to my soul, I could release my father from a burden he did not deserve to carry. And that's why you can appreciate the joy when I was able to then take him forward into a rededication to the Lord and then baptize that man myself. And that's why I began our conversation that if it isn't resolved in your life yet, yet is a very important word. That's what Naaman teaches us. Getting back to Naaman as we wrap it up. You know, Naaman walked away from his potential miracle because he wanted a zap, not a process. But you know, his friends prevailed upon him and said, Naaman, you are a bear. And you're angry. And, and not submitting to God's process, not, not yielding yourself to his wisdom, it, it's not helping we really wish you would reconsider. And Naaman reconsidered. How awesome is God to let you reconsider? Because sometimes the first time you're not convinced. And he reconsidered and realized that not submitting wasn't helping him. Waiting for a zap wasn't fixing it. So he decided, I'll reconsider. I'll go back to those waters and I will dunk myself seven times. And so he did. And the Bible says when he came up the seventh time, his skin was cleansed of defilement. I guess the cautionary note here is, what if he had quit at number four? What if he had said at number five, I don't see much difference. What's the point? There is a case to be made to keep on dunking until the issues are thoroughly resolved. They may not be done yet, but yet is a very important word. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. You are already with us and you live in us. And you are here to perpetually be a provision to make us clean, to support us, to guide us, to help us because you know our weaknesses and you love us anyway. And you're committed to helping us. Our weaknesses do not offend you. As much as I need to speak that word to God's children, I want to say something to those of you who may be here and you are not yet God's. 
You're coming along to church. You're seeking, and that's a great thing. Seek, and the Lord said, you'll find. Knock, the door will be open to you. If you're here and you were not in a right space with God, while our heads are bowed in a private and sacred moment, I'm going to ask you something. If you know you are not in that right place with God, Jesus came and made the way back to the Father. His sacrifice has opened the door where we can now be adopted as God's children to experience His love, His help, His provision. And he dresses that up also in the skin of his people, which is why he founded the church, the community of his children. And if you do not belong to that community, because you do not yet belong to God, you can with a decision today. You can say, yes, God, I do need, I do need you, and I do want you. I do want to be your child. In fact, we're going to pray a prayer just like that. Why don't you put your hand on your heart? Especially Christians, you praying for those here who may not yet be God's children, yet is a very important word that can change even in a moment. Something new can be begun. So while my words are not a, an incantation, they are a prayer. They are words of life. They give form to what we're describing. And so if you're here you have your hand over your heart. You know you're not in that right place with God. You can be. You can give your life to Jesus. You can invite him to redeem yours. So if you're here today, and that's what you want, you know you're ready, you know this is what you need, then the beginning of that process of not just being made clean, but becoming God's child and the ability to receive his love in full, if that's you and you want that today, then... I would ask that you pray these words after me. In fact, we're all going to say this together. These words have power and life. So don't be ashamed and don't be afraid. God loves you and he's waiting to show you how much. As you begin that journey like I did so many decades ago, let's say these words together, everyone, especially you, saying them perhaps for the first time. Here we go. Say after me, Father in heaven. Father in heaven. I do want you. I do want you. I do need you. I do need you. Make me your child. Make me your child. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. Remove my guilt. Remove my guilt. I believe Jesus came to do this for me. I believe Jesus came to do this for me. I give you my life. I give you my life. Just as it is. Just as it is. Take it. Take it. And make it what you want. And make it what you want. I am yours now. I am yours now. Filled with your spirit. Filled with your spirit. Illumined by your word. Illumined by your word. A member of your family. A member of your family. Now and forever. Now and forever. Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We celebrate your decision. I love you, heart of God.